All right. Good morning, everyone. And this time around, it's not just me talking. We have uh, Rafan's been in Miguel Campos with us. Um, I'm not going to call it a Cult of Freak stream because it's not as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is just something that uh, we've been talking about in some chats for a while. And what was it? I think Raf published this article about rigging as software. Um, I really liked it. I told him, can we do a stream together? And apparently I had just told him Raf by five seconds from Miguel, who wanted to do the same thing, but was typing slower than I was. He was like, yeah, whatever, yes. let's, <laughs> let's get all together. So, yeah, well, you're pretty fast typing, yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, guys. Uh, welcome, Raf. Welcome, Miguel. And, uh, and the theme, if you have not been following Twitter, uh, is rigging a software development or rigs a software and that's about it so do you guys want to introduce yourselves just a lightning sure. one minute introduction thing um, uh, go uh, ahead miguel please, come on ahead. you first okay uh, i can go first okay uh or unless you're going first I... no, no go, please no no uh, all right um uh hi i'm raf hanzevin um uh, I have been doing a lot of rigging and animation related stuff for a long time. Probably the thing I'm most well known for is the set of machine um, and its various derivatives um, in terms of rigging. Uh, but I've worked on a lot of stuff. I mean, most recent. I mean, I've done a lot of animation for a lot of like commercials and projects and things. And I guess most recently, the one that would stick in people's minds maybe is uh, remember that Black Panther commercial with um, toy commercial was getting a lot of attention on the net where. Um, you know, he sort of like jumps into the shot. I mean, it's this tiny little shot, but like that is a that is a piece of animation and rigging that I have done recently that people will probably have seen. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've just done a lot of stuff. I used to have a uh, I used to have a company called Anzimut Studio. Um, now I work more or less solo, um, although often with the same team of people. Uh, we're just not really a studio anymore. Um, and I really am interested in developing and have been for a very long time, and it's been taking a very long time to come into any sort of fruition, um, in developing better production models for the idea of making the kinds of movies or other forms of entertainment, I mean, I don't insist on cinema per se, um, that I would like to make, but that I don't feel like the animation industry right now is really well set up to make. So I guess that that is it. Oh, uh, well, I guess my turn. Uh, well, hi, I'm Miguel. Um... A uh, rigger mainly, uh, character TD sometimes depends of the the title, but um, yeah, I'm mainly uh, developing M Gear. That it's uh, the framework uh, for rigging. It was started by Jeremy Passerin, but I took took over the development a few years now, and I keep it advancing this this uh, set of tools. And I'm working in here in Tokyo in a company called Anime Studios. I'm the uh, rigging supervisor there, I'm working in several projects, uh, mainly like uh, series and game cinematics. And yeah, in the past, I've been working like in many areas like uh, feature films, uh, mainly for uh, um, character animation and advertisement. And yeah, that's that's it. All right, Sue. So always for the intro what i was talking about is this is raf's website uh as far as rants and rambles go i love it personally you know i do it's uh just do something bad.com is it uh yes and this is this is the post i mean it's like the thing that always cracks me up is your illustrations um the fact that you do yeah, a custom one for every article sort of something to put up there and a lot of the time there wasn't an obvious like screenshot or something and i was like i should just draw some sort of little cartoons or something also it's... also that's not something i get to do a lot yeah it's in great man way that other people see right i draw like boards and draw overs and stuff all the time but i don't really get to actually draw things that other people look at outside <laughs> yeah. of the context of production always always cracks me out and miguel instead you can find as uh Mikel with a Q dash campus dot com, but apparently uh, we are supposed to call you Miguel with the hard G, right? 
Uh, well, <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> uh, officially, I'm Miguel. Uh, the, the thing is that in my family, there, there is uh, several Miguels. Uh, it's a Spanish tradition to put the same name over generations. So yeah. that's the way it is like kind of nickname. Yeah, okay. So I did not want to cover people's faces while they were talking. And this is M-Gear. People don't know it. It's actually, at this point, it's a pretty damn full-fledged rigging system. It's it's pretty bulky. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in it. I don't know, I mean, people tell me they don't know where I find the time to do the stuff I do. I don't know where you find the time to do the stuff you do. So, <laughs> and uh, or, or Raph for that matter. But anyway, so. Well, sometimes it's hard to do or I would have made more progress. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, yeah, it's always like yeah, that. Currently, I'm, 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 I'm really lucky because Anima Studio is it, it's very supportive with the, with the development of M-Gear. So it's a big thanks for them because... They allow me to, to develop there on the uh, working time. And, ah, this is your secret. Well, that it's like from one year now that I'm working there. Before it was not like that, <laughs> uh, but now it's 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 a bit uh, easier. And also I have help from other developers. So yeah, that it's probably you, you see it's it's getting faster to develop now. Yeah. Okay. No, it's um, I don't get to stream from work. Uh, the M the MPAA would not <laughs> like that. <laughs> I would probably yeah, get shot in the back by one of the, the Marvel snipers <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yeah, and I I think it's it's a rare, uh, rare uh, situation, but it, I'm super happy. Honestly, that's uh, it's gold. It's gold. Yeah, no, well done, man. So um, let's. Uh, I mean, we, we had a conversation before people are wondering and it was like, yeah, look, we're going to chat for 50 minutes, figure something out. And I think we went for like almost two hours. Um, now, that's uh, it's, it's going to be tough because I think all three of us could talk about this for several hours. Um, so I will shut up for the most part. Hopefully I'll manage. And uh, Raph and Miguel will actually do most of the talking. Now, I have a... I have a few notes and I have my memory of the conversation and I think we said that we would have started with, we would have allowed us to start with a little bit of rambling about the whole notion of um, over-engineering the APIs and, you know, and stuff like that, which which might be a rough start for something like that. So. Um, when we say rigging a software, I think I've been mentioning it on the code a little bit, and you know, it's I, I still reckon that. In fact, I think I did a presentation, an official one about it. Um, I certainly have been talking about it at work for a bit. It's pretty much demonstrable that rigging is software development, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, when you when you look at what defines software development in a professional environment, <clears throat> rigging ticks all the same boxes from you know, in and output data, which is motion and meshes and the transform meshes, backwards and forwards compatibility, development, the the problems are all the same of, you know, software that has a user-based feature creep and complexity performance, uh, deliveries versioning. So as far as I'm concerned, it's it's a given. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna leave my take on it at that. Um, let's, let's go in you know in order like raf and then miguel because that's how we started i guess we we can keep doing that instead of keep telling each other no 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 you go first sure uh yeah, raf you, you, you should moderate this uh oh, hopefully not i mean you guys are not gonna fight are you yeah. oh I, I don't think so um yeah, <laughs> so i guess i will i will start then and i should say to people in the watching the stream like certainly i'm kind of watching the the chat so if you want to ask me questions in the middle you should do that and I may or may not notice but if I do I will definitely answer them. Um, so uh, yeah so for me actually this realization that rigging is software um, it isn't a completely new thing I've certainly heard this before and often from other people I was working with like uh, Tagore Smith who uh, was uh, one of the programmers uh, along with Brian Kendall on Ansible and Rig Tools and when I hired him he was like, well, basically this rigging thing that you're doing is basically software. And I was like, well, I can see why you say that, but that's not really how I think about it. So it's been an interesting experience to come from a background of like, I definitely don't come from a software development background at all. 
like I'm basically an animator and then I started doing a lot of rigging because I wanted to have rigs that were not terrible and that ended up building into this career doing a bunch of rigging but it, I mean like I have no background in in anything sort of software related um and uh to so essentially come to the realization that not only is rigging software but I kind of want to develop it literally in a text editor um, and not from the point of view of you write a Python script that generates a rig, because one of the points that we were sort of discussing before is that, um, you know, you know, I feel I feel like what you actually get with auto rigging systems a lot of the time is it's like they it, it's like you're writing something that compiles to a rig, like it's it's, I mean they're both programs. You're writing a program that generates a program, which is not unheard of. Obviously, people do that all the time, but um, I mean actually it's one of the really like compiling things is a really normal aspect of software development right but um but that it is really when you're doing when you're doing that you're supposed to be developing it in something that's less complex or appropriately abstracted or in some other way going to make things easier for you than just expressing things directly in whatever the underlying sort of representation is and then in the case of auto rigging it may or may that may or may not be the case right i mean i think that we have probably all had experiences dealing with auto rigging systems um and like i'm as i'm as responsible for this as anybody else you know where where there's there's they're over engineered to the point where if you were to simply express the rig as code it would actually be much simpler and to some degree that's sort of the realization i've come to is like actually um it turns out that simply writing a rig as code which is not the only way you can approach this question of rigs of software of course like the hooking up nodes together is also programming really but um but appro approaching it as literally this is a program that i am writing um turns out to be considerably easier than a i would have expected and b a lot of the other things that i might have tried to do and did try to do earlier on to get the results that i'm trying to get um one of the things that surprised me was how much simpler it made the process to simply have a program that runs and is your rig um because uh, essentially as inputs of the user is moving a transform around, calculates uh, other transforms in whatever way you choose, right? It's a complete black box as far as Maya is concerned, and then just tells those transforms where to go. Um, and uh, one of the major things that you get for this is the ability to actually really control evaluation in a way that uh, I guess isn't actually impossible in the context of the Maya node graph, because I have now heard of these things about custom evaluators, but certainly is not obvious or straightforward um and uh you know this ability to sort of like i in order to do the ephemeral rig system that i i sort of have exam you know videos of on the blog and i may show a little bit of it here if we get to that but um in order to do that i was um uh you know i mean i wrote my own node graph and my naive assumption about this try starting out with the process of doing this was well, I don't know. That seems like the sort of thing a real developer would be needed for, right? I'm not sure if I can write my own node graph. No, it's incredibly simple. And it's actually pretty fast to evaluate. Um, and surprisingly, because I made absolutely no effort whatsoever to, to, um, to, to, to uh, you know, I made, I made no effort to make it performant. I, I, it's, in all, it's all in Python. It's all completely single. So, Graph. Yeah. Can can I ask you a question? This this actually came to me after we had the chat the other day because everybody seems to agree that oh, rigging is clearly software. You know, rigs are software, mm -hmm. and rigging is software dev. <clears throat> and yet, like when we say, we almost mean it as if it's a disruptive notion. And you know, I, I guess you get what I'm saying. So, what is almost everybody would agree with the phrase? I guess it's kind of like. You know, everybody would agree with the phrase uh, the truisms or goodisms like, you know, oh, racism, racism is bad. Everybody will agree that a lot of people are racist sure. anyway. So what is what is rigging not as a software? Like, what is the mistake that people might make, you reckon, uh, that will make the rigging process not software dev-like or the rigs? uh not make them treat rigs not as software what do you reckon is the difference between rigging as software and not rigging as software right so i think i think there's there's kind of two aspects of it one of which is probably um more more easy to to fit into common you know current concepts of rigging 
than others, and, and one of and, and that's one that you are championing very much yourself, which is, you know, you should really treat compo rigging components the way you would treat things in software. They should be you should be able to um, encapsulate them. You should be able to, uh, you know, um, you should treat the you you should think about how the data is flowing because while one might naively think that any anyone who's rigging should be thinking about how data is flowing through the graph, right? Actually, uh, the answer is a lot of the time people who are rigging, and certainly I include myself at various times, are not thinking about that at all, and not thinking about the actual organization of the graph in the way that you would have to think about the organization of um, the organization of, uh, of you know a, a software project. Um, then there's the other aspect of it, which is that the rig being enforced to a particular sort of, of, uh, of evaluation because it is a node graph and nodes are hooked up together and that's, that's all there is, right, theoretically. Except actually there isn't because even Autodesk breaks their own stuff all the time. Um, you, know, uh, you know, forces you into a particular model of how things behave. And I think that's become really pathological. Um, uh, like, um, you know, this was this was an example I was using in one of those discussions that we were having on, on TV's Anonymous, which is, um, you know, it's like, it's like you have all it's, it's so so control rigging. I mean, deformation can potentially be pretty complicated, but control rigging, in terms of its actual behavior, in terms of like what how you want it to respond to what the user is doing, this was something I realized when putting together the system is all incredibly simple. Actually, there's nothing complicated about you know, how transforms relate to each other. What makes it complicated is that you take every conceivable way that you want to, might, might want to have an animator interact with something and you stack them on top of each other in a haphazard way so that so that uh, they all have to, you don't have to just have to manage that particular interaction. You have to manage how is it going to affect every other aspect of the rig because it's all one system and that system can never really change from moment to moment. And I think that thinking of rigs as software development, um, as opposed to purely as this idea of like, oh, well, we make some constraints, you know, uh, is sort of a prerequisite to getting outside of that problem. Because um, as long as you think of rigging as like, well, I make some bones and then I stick constraints on them, as opposed to I think about information and I think about how the user is interacting with it and I use all the sort of conceptual software development tools like, you know, uh, you know, all, everything that people have developed about UI and how to interact with users and just like, I mean, I don't even know a lot of this stuff, right? I'm not really a software developer, but there's a whole world of, you know, people who have, have been dealing with this problem of making software for end users for decades. And, um, you know, it, all too often in rigging, we just completely ignore all of that. Um, so it looks like somebody just posted a question. Yeah, there's, uh, there's so a few. This, this, um, um, I'm right seeing one here, so I don't know if I'm seeing... Uh, all the, the whole chat because it's like cut off or something yeah don't don't worry i'm i'm again. i'm piling them up i'll, I'll cue them in uh okay yeah can. i i think i'm definitely not seeing the whole chat that's chat can, chat in but, twitch can be super temperamental don't don't worry yeah I, yeah um, i got you i got uh, two different clients to track chat because at any given time yeah. one of them poops itself oh so our, our Craig uh, 35 is the one question that I that I can see. So I will answer that one. And if other people have, have typed questions in there, I, for whatever reason, cannot see them. Um, but anyway, if you're talking about how would that feed into something like art, well, actually, that is um, that is basically how I'm doing these tests, right? Art is handling all the deformation. And for those of you who are not aware of this, Ends of Rig Tools is the um, deformation and spline-based rigging system that me and Tagore Smith and Brian Kendall have been working on for a really long time and that hopefully will be coming out as an actual product sometime in the near future. Um, it's been very difficult for us to do that outside, uh, you know, br bring it out when we all have so much other stuff going on. But um, uh, but basically it's a, um, it, it so, so you can think about the way that I'm approaching these things as like, so you have the control rig. And Sorry, everything Raph. ephemeral. Can, I'll, I'll interrupt you for one second because people that will watch the recording or even a lot of people on Twitch in full screen don't know. The question was, um, oh, somebody was saying they, they follow your posts on your blog and they are looking at interpolation less, which is fairly disruptive and I don't think we have mentioned it. 
and that person was asking so you you gotta read those posts to be honest i mean yeah. I think, oh, personally point. i think they're pretty right. good so and the person was asking how will this feed into something like art which is uh the rigging system what what is it for hands of being rigging tools right yeah that's what that's yeah what for. so that that um, was the question do you do you yeah. want to cover that in a couple of minutes then we flip it over to miguel yeah i think so um so basically uh you can think of it like this so um the control rig aspect of things the ephemeral the ephemeral dg uh you know feeds into all these transform nodes that are just hanging out in world space so um there's no uh within the ephemeral parts of the rig there's no uh, parenting there's no constraints there's no interrelationships between any of those things within the context of the maya dg well not i mean the maya graph um uh that's all handled by the ephemeral DG. So if you move one thing, it builds the graph, tells the other things what to do, but only in that moment. But then there's the other layer of deformation. And I'm not handling deformation in the context of the ephemeral ring. Um, and while I imagine one could, and of course this was how things worked, for instance, with reflex, um, which was, uh, well, I, I, I can't, that's a bit of a side tangent, so I'm going to leave that aside for the moment. But one could have everything about a ring be purely ephemeral, including the deformation, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so the deformation is happening where basically these transforms that are handing out in world space, they're feeding into the bones that are driving the deformation. And in the case of art, um, especially for cartoony rigs, this makes things super simple because art is a spline-based rigging system. So essentially what you're doing is just saying like, okay, all of these transforms that are hanging out in world space, these are control points pretty much, or they're, they're gonna control control points in the art rig. In this case, just through Maya you know, constraints or Maya connections. So uh, Raf, uh just a question so you can see there like your your art it's like the deformation system and your ephemeral mm -hmm. rig is your your uh, control and behavioral system so yeah you, you have like two systems to tackle that probably is one of the two pillars of uh rigging in terms of final asset it's the, the, the behavioral and, and manipulation and the deformation yeah yeah exactly that's that's what's going on so so um art now you know and again like and like obviously i'm talking about my own product here so you know Oh. Uh, take, it's okay. Take, We're take okay it with it. It's, it. it's it's what it's. it's yeah, it makes it be. super easy, and of course, most people haven't had a chance to do much with it because it's not out yet. Um, but uh, it makes it super easy to set up stuff like that because it is really, um, uh, it really doesn't care all that much in terms of what sort of inputs it's getting from outside transforms. So it's very easy to do things like, oh, well, you know, I have this arm, and I just I don't like put the elbow wherever I want, you know, do put something between the elbow and the wrist wherever I want. I can just constrain those to whatever transforms I want. You know, it doesn't have, there's not a whole system underneath for managing twist or managing sort of like arm stretch or any of these other things. So that's very helpful because I, the ephemeral rig system just has to worry about where do those transforms go. And then art can just be like, all right, each of those transforms drives a control point, basically, um, conceptually. They're, they're bones and we call them bone CDs and stuff. But, um, and then and then the splines are what actually drives the mesh and it has its own method of deforming the mesh based on splines that Makes it really easy to just stick a spline through something and get a good result So I reckon that's that's where we we gotta like leave the rest for some partial demo of it And I know everybody's itching to see yeah. both of you demos and stuff Miguel want, want to give your take on rigging a software Okay, thank you. Um, well in my case, um um, I'm, I think uh, the, 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 the work I'm doing and, and the, uh, the, the, the point that I'm focusing more is, is not like in the evaluation or the, the deformation like uh, Raf is doing, that it's, uh, I, I believe it's, it's more disruptive and I'm really interested on, in your tools because it's it's completely different approach of what I'm taking. Uh, on my side, I think it's not that like new, let's say, the, the way, but I'm more focused on the uh, on the workflow and the process of the of this data and the um, like the, uh, the day by day production on the on how you tackle like a big amount of assets and with a constant changes and constant input from clients, our directors and things. So it's not like um, I don't know how to say like, but it's it's not like the dependency graph that I think it's it's uh, or the the evaluation that it's, it's something innovative there. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> but more in the uh, in the the control of the data 
and then that uh, was uh, the workshop I'm doing and trying to, to go in this direction is the, the data centric that by the way I came out with this uh, name I don't know Ra uh, Raphael if that makes sense because I know it for you was a bit uh, like misleading the data centric thing uh, the way I, I, I thought on that and no, no, not really. I mean, it's we. It's a funny thing. I'm, I'm not a fan of naming in general, but we all have to do it, especially when you want to talk to somebody. It's, no, no, I don't. I don't think it's off. I was just curious if you back then when we talked about it, if you meant uh, data oriented, uh, the way you know Mike Acton's talk will go, or the way uh, I will think of data oriented rigging. And it turns out that you mean something different. But I find it perfectly legitimate for the record. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to describe the idea, but basically it's it's just decompose as much as you can in small parts and these parts should be agnostic as much as possible. Like uh, you don't save Maya files. I'm doing it now, but in I hope in the future it's not using any Maya file at all. It's everything decomposed in JSON files and other uh, files that contain small data like arrays and things like that. And then rebuild over and over again and reusability. So. And here as a software, I think it covers like uh, one thing that is maintainability and debugging of the of the assets, that is the final render or the final compilation of the, the process. And also the um, tackling the over-engineering of the thing. So basically I I try to avoid like the mega rigs. Even I, I think the default rig that you get out, it's, it's quite rich in features. But if I can avoid it, like I, I don't put half of the feature because I don't need it. I mean, it depends on the project. Every project is different. And even the same kind of projects may need different style of uh, things. And, um, and yeah, that's it. So it's try to keep everything as simple as possible. Don't in over engineer, don't so put a ton of options or things. So just keep it simple and encapsulate this in a li little uh, like, I don't know, modules of code that you can combine together and you get the, the render that, or the compiled version that is the rig itself. But yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I covered your face for a moment. I I was looking for data centric rigging 001 colon introduction and it's on Mgear, uh, the, the YouTube channel for Mgear, right? Yeah, there is a playlist uh, yeah. that is a data centric rigging so workshop or something like that. I, I covered and your I face with the right thing. Yeah, there, there's a few playlists there. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, the general concept. And of course, uh, there is also rigging, the way I rig, that it's not by any means anything uh, that should take as the best way to do it because probably it's pretty wrong. But the general concept is the, the most interesting thing. Um, yeah, for me, uh, I've been doing a lot of advertisement and allow in other kind of productions, there is always the same issue in terms of uh, like in, if you do like your short film or your uh, student project or something, you have clearly where you're going or you have more time. But when you have a client or someone that uh, is not necessarily knows how it works 3D, you need to have flexibility in the way that uh, you process your uh, your rigs, and that also uh, remember me like maybe kind of agile uh, or scrum process where you you put your rig as fast as you can the first the first iteration that is maybe just for start blocking or to to make layouts and then you keep iterating every. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like and again this is this is a thing that I kind of came to in a way is like. When we say rigging is a software, we don't really mean it as a disruptive concept. It's like other than beginners at this point or people that do it, you know, just to get something out of the way. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly disruptive notion. I think everybody will pretty much agree with it for the most part. But it sounds like what we've all been saying is uh, you will encounter exactly the same issues that you will encounter during software development uh the the scale is similar as in the larger the scale of your rigging operation the more similar to a similar scale of software development the issues become and so on so that's the parallel for the record you know graph especially was saying oh i'm not a software engineer so uh, you, you were saying that 
people seem not to consider these things that you were talking about, which is, you know, the right type of modularity boundaries and, uh, and Miguel was talking about in in some yeah in some regards for the most part I think you're talking the most about modularity and again about uh, module boundaries and certainty module boundaries and stuff like that. The staggering majority of software engineers and almost all the designers that also happen to do architecture and really shouldn't do it make the same or worse mistakes than the one you're ascribing to rigors. Good software development and good management of software development is exceedingly rare to find. That's uh, that's how we ended up with the internet and JavaScript and all of these horrifying things. <laughs> or at least that's, that's my view of it. Yeah. I don't know, does that sound like a fair assessment? Is that what we're saying? I mean, if I, I have something to say, but uh, you should go first because you're Go. It's, your, it's your turn right now. Go, Miguel. So. Uh, no, no, I, I was just wanted to, yeah, like, it, even, uh, like, in, in th team management, and, and like, if you, you, you I, 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 I've been reading, like, some literature on team management for uh, code development, like this book, Scrum, and some others, and it, it's pretty close, the, the same issues and the same, um, like, um, roadblocks that you find on management, a team that should pull out these these rigs on these these assets, and what I read on on articles and, and books on the uh, code development that you you want to make the mega asset, but at the end, like everything gets complex and to to, to put all the people in in, in tune to, to make to process this data or this this information through, it's it's yeah it's very tight. Like you can see almost change the world rig by this, and you know you get the same uh, blueprint. <laughs> Kind of. All right. So, in in the same order, let's. I would say let's give these literally a million each as an exercise, and and then let's see if we can move on to a demo because that's likely to spark some discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, your n number one recommendation that should be taken from software development and you don't need to be a formally trained software engineer or anything to give a recommendation like that the one thing that you think look this comes from software development it's not common in rigging but you really really should do it you know use use this one trick grandma discovered from software development to rig better in one minute or less could you find something like that Mine would be, to be honest, would be watch my cactus that oriented talk. All of it applies. All of it, the entirety. So there you go. It's my, mine is a lot shorter than a minute. Uh, it's hard to pick one, I guess. Um, yeah, I know. Well, pick the first one that comes to mind. It doesn't need to be the most important. Grandma has m many tricks. Uh, Raph, please go first. So. <laughs> so I actually, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna maybe sort of not quite answer the question because I, I can't, I don't, I can't figure out how to boil it down to one thing. But here is what I do think is maybe kind of an answer, which is that I think that even thinking about things that way at all may actually be more uh, disruptive than, uh, than, than everyone realizes. Because if you're working on rigs and you're doing it in the capacity of like you're working on a feature film or you're working at a high-end commercial house or something like that, then probably, yeah, this concept isn't that, isn't that um, uh, dis disruptive. But, but so many people who are actually doing rigging are, are nowhere even near that realization, actually. And, um, uh, and so I think the one thing that I would I would say about it um, is is I mean this is a weird thing to say about like take from software development because it seems obvious but uh, don't be afraid of code code is actually much less scary than you might think um, uh, you know I think there's this almost pathological thing in some aspects of the CG world obviously not the whole thing lots of people are writing their own stuff but you know it's, it's sort of like oh code is a weird thing that weird people who are sort of like wizardly do and they can do you know code things and it's it's this sort of arcane art that cannot be understood and uh you know that's not true at all um a lot of useful things you can do with code are not that hard to understand at all and in fact in fact here's all right so here's the thing i'm probably going over a minute now but here's 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 the main thing um there's there's a there's a false idea that because you can see something because it's visual you're actually making it easier to understand and uh that's actually in many cases not true 
looking at some nodes and connections between nodes, for instance, is often harder to understand than some code that calls various functions. Um, and, uh, and, and people, I, I, I feel, don't necessarily understand that this is true and don't necessarily understand that a lot of the yeah. supposedly user-friendly ways of doing things are actually much less user-friendly than something that you might think seems more technical. Mm -hmm. um, but he's actually not hard to understand if you, you know, like in, in reality. So yeah. sorry, I'm sure I took more than a minute there. Uh, no, no, I just want to, to acknowledge what you say there, because um, I remember back uh, when it, uh, in soft image, good old times, <laughs> mm -hmm. there was the God, God uh, rest his soul. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to have it. <laughs> <laughs> I am still using it, by the way. Anyway, but um, the thing is the um, Mathematics, and probably uh, Rafael did a good amount of time working on that. I don't know, but I, I found always super hard to maintain. Well, in general, the whatever you can do with ice was super easy to prototype and do stuff. But then when it comes down to to maintain these these graphs, nodes, and the ice kinematics and so on, I found super super difficult to 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 go there after a few time and not all my my own compounds and and debug or change the, the things there i and i found more much more easier in in code I, I think it's especially when you you do something and you 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 don't touch it for for a long time or for for a good amount of time that you go back and you read your code and it's, it was always easier for me to then then go in the, on the notes and uh, maybe because i I try to put like comments on the notes and everything, and like make the compounds when it makes sense, like to to make some uh, elements there. But it was always harder. I think <laughs> it's fast, and then maintainability it's it's harder. And the the previous question that uh, Rafael did, like uh, on the on the coding, it's um, I think after uh, thinking a little, yeah, I will say like maintainability and iteration it's two things that you should keep in mind when you do code when you do uh develop software development and this applies to rigging so maintainability and uh this iteration so if it's your code or your rig is maintainable it means you can do more iterations so and it's something i like to think like a big slogan is don't buy your rig don't buy the rig so never buy the rig so if you you're not happy with the rig you should always had the op option to um, to keep updating it, to keep uh, making uh, debugging on this or uh, adding features. Of course, if you don't break the uh, the interface, in this case, it's the animators, uh, animation publishing and controls and so on. So you, you should keep your interfaces, but you don't need to, to say, oh, I cannot touch the rig. Uh, this is asset, <coughs> oh, I, it was three, five persons who edit the asset. And if the asset is kind of a magic voodoo now, and if I touch something there, uh, it's gonna break. That it's something that it happened in code when it's bad, it's uh, like maintain and a lot of garbage happening, and it happened in rigs when, uh, especially uh, if it's asset oriented rigging in a facility where several people does the same thing. I, I don't know if you, you agree or not, but I, I saw sometimes like, ooh, I don't touch this, this rig is not, it's gonna break, just handle that. No, I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with, uh, like, I do that I do all the time, and this also, I think, comes very much with the software as, as uh, programming thing. And like I said, you know, I don't always practice what I, I mean, I didn't say this, but I'm gonna say it now. I don't always practice <laughs> what I preach, because the, the, the press of production, and the fact that existing methods exist, you just have to get something done. So that means you do it the wrong way. But um, I've, yeah. a lot of the time, it's this situation. It's like, oh, I can't modify this rig because that's so and so right. And I don't know what's going on in there, right? And um, to a certain extent, I know that that is sometimes true of code as well. It's it's not always easy to understand other people's code, but there's a lot of tools for that. I mean, to, just to take an obvious example, like you can diff, you know, different revisions to code. It's like, how would you even do that? with a like node graph that's you know um and so there's there's i mean people have been programming code for a long time and obviously they don't always do it well but there's a lot of conceptual bits there where people have figured out how to make it relatively easy to understand that just don't exist in the reading space yeah I think, yeah for 
on, on my side, on the uh, for the current team I'm uh, working on on Anima. Yeah, that's something that one of the things that I'm most proud of the team and, and the way that we we tackle the, the the current projects is the we don't have ownership of the the rig or and something like that. That also was a kind of conversation that we had on the on the chats. Um, yeah, everybody can take anything and kind of continue the work of other persons. So if it comes a retakes and the person who did the rig was working in other stuff and you don't want to disrupt his flow on this, so on, uh, the first available person can take over. And because this modularity or this maintainability or of the things, it's quite easy, I think. I hope maybe uh, some of my colleagues will not agree with that, but I think it's quite easy to, um, yeah, to move forward to another uh, person and and keep rolling the the this this rig this software. Yeah. So um, yeah. Do we want to uh, do we want to do some demoing? Um, yeah, I reckon. Look, it's um, it's definitely time to get onto a demo because I, I think there's only so much talking heads that people can take. Yeah. Well, apparently not because I. You know, there are YouTube channels with millions of subscribers where this just uh, not even particularly handsome dude talking for hours. Um, but <laughs> what no. on, 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 on the assumption that all three of us are middle aged, balding males and we're probably, you know, what? not not that <laughs> interesting <laughs> anyway. So, we, with that weird tangent aside, can you show something? We get, you do the usual order, Raf, and show sure. um, show some of your stuff because I, I know people are super keen to see it. so if you're watching a recording of these and you don't want to interrupt like please start feel free to start sharing the desktop and i'll mm -hmm. i'll yep. get things going and um you you don't want to interrupt your watching time and look at things on the blog let me see if i can find the right entry anyway go on raf's website which is just do something bad.com which for the record is another thing i love um because i'm a big fan of just doing something instead of like talking about it all the time as i talk about it and then um, go go over his archive <clears throat> there's a few key things that are worth picking up which is you know the whole notion of ephemeral rig um certainly applies and you you will find uh some good rants about lack of tools the zebrash analogy is one of them and key from interpolation. I guess those are the three big sticks of Raf's talk. It's, uh, you know, that, yeah, th take it like, away. Like, um, ephemeral rigging and, and, and interpolationless animation are very tied together. Um, and they don't uh, necessarily have to be. Like, you could use this in an interpolated context, but, you know, it makes it makes it makes everything much easier basically and you know the way i'm designing things right now is definitely intended for an interpolationless context so anyway yeah so um so first of all i should mention i actually had a much better demo earlier today where i had set up i was setting up like the whole character but uh then i managed to break something horribly and i'm not entirely sure what so i had to revert to an earlier commit and as a result a you're just going to basically see the same stuff i showed in the videos but i can probably show you a little more of how it works uh and b um, conceivably, there could still be something broken in here, and maybe it's going to blow up in my face. I really hope not, but uh, I guess we'll find out. So, um, basically, I'm just going to show a really quick uh, example of ephemeral stuff being moved around. So I have a bunch of controls here, and they're just cubes, and they're invisible because I just, I don't know, I was testing out different ways of looking at controls. But basically, um, all the motion that the rest of this leg is getting... So I can like position things over here and then I can move them over there and you know I've got the ability to rotate the toe and you know all of that stuff actually it's from the keel but we'll do something useful there we go um like all of this stuff is um uh is ephemeral in the sense that there's no actual relationship in the scene graph between this object and these other and these other transforms they're actually literally here let me show you in the outliner uh they are literally just hanging out in world space with no connection to each other whatsoever nothing is driving them they are just there uh doing doing their thing and um it's the ephemeral graph that's driving them by directly setting their flux so one of the things that you may note here looking over my script editor is if i'm every time i click on something uh it's going to do this thing it's going to kill the f callback it, which which kills like the whole ephemeral system 
It's going to build the whole system, printing a bunch of stuff that I was useful to me while I was working on it. So just like, it's some stuff. And then it's going to build it again. Um, so every time I, I change my selection, um, or if I change my method of manipulation. So I have just a bunch of variables that I can set that are like, all right, if I set it to forward manipulation, it's going to set a bunch of controls to be a particular way. Um, these are just their particular settings. And uh, then uh, the ephemeral, it's going to build a new graph that operates in a different way. Um, except, except for in that case, I did it wrong. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, like I said, <laughs> uh, pretend that didn't happen. Um, but basically, uh, I think I know. I think I know why that happened. Actually, um, so now this is this is forward kinematics. If I turn off my forward minute variable and turn on the backwards minute variable, then it's going to be uh, the same exact controls. But now the hierarchy is in the opposite direction. Um, so uh, so here's here's an example that we were talking about. Um, uh, we were talking about in uh, uh, in the TV anonymous. All right. So so this is like if this were a conventional. Uh, you know, foot uh, reverse foot break. You know, let's say let's say you put your foot down there, and you like rotate the heel up, and uh, you then want to pick things up from the heel. Uh, well, your your your, you know, your pivot is down here somewhere probably, and that's not particularly helpful. And people have learned to deal with it, but it's it's not awesome. On the other hand, here, and uh, you know, I would actually like maybe assign these to keys, or maybe I. Uh, maybe have like a little interface for it. I haven't really decided yet, but I'm going to maybe experiment with some stuff. But you can see how you could just have a button that changes these things out as needed. Um, I now have switched it back to FK, uh, or actually, let me let me turn off forwards minute so that it will be both FK and, um, you know, and like sort of fake IK. And the pivot is back here because literally there's no there's no like reverse foot hierarchy. There's no um, you know. Uh, set of, of uh, sort of interrelationships between things that necessitates additional nodes and additional connections. It's just that their connection between themselves may be completely different from moment to moment. Um, here's another little thing I can do. If I turn off suspend, which is my like fake IK, then the, the, uh, the knee gets pinned. But unlike, like I'm not changing anything space per se. I'm just changing what their relationships to each other are. And what this does is makes things absurdly simple to arrange for. And calculate um, because there's no uh, there's there's no way that these various systems or various various interaction modes can interact with each other or have to interact with each other. Um, so let me and I'm you know I'm trying not to take too much time about this. Let me really quickly show you how some of this stuff Ref, actually operates. Yep. Can I interrupt you for just a second for the benefit of those that have not read the articles? Uh, the the idea here is that if you look at a component like the leg that Raf was manipulating as a set of features, you know, FK, IK, pivoting from the foot, uh, pivoting from, sorry, from the heel of the foot, pivoting from the tip and so on, there, there exists a word where based on what you choose in the control, so which is basically context fishing, you destroy the super rig with all the complications and all of that and you just create the subsection of the rig which controls forward only kind of style only the kind of behavior you need uh, builds a graph on the fly for that saves the results of that very small very fast graph to the actual rig which is probably going to be extremely simple and then if you change the modality of control <clears throat> You're basically changing the control rig. Is that is that a fair you know thirty second summary? Yep, that's exactly it. I mean, basically the idea here is the reason why this is simple is because, I mean, you can imagine this, and this wouldn't really this would be like if you tried to implement this in the Maya graph. I think it would be problematic, but uh, because I have my own graph, instead of changing its state whenever I want it to interact differently, I just destroy it and create a new one. So it's imagine you had a control rig with transform nodes in Maya and constraints and whatever other stuff you had connecting them together and just every time you wanted to manipulate it a different way you just literally deleted all the nodes and made new ones uh, that were connected up the way that you wanted like that's basically what's going on here um, and as a result it lets you um, like it lets me just avoid enormous amounts of complication and just interact with the rig in whatever way I want to and uh, because so much of the problem of, that I had 
I had an earlier version of the system where I was trying to do aspects of the control rig in Maya and some parts that were ephemeral, and it just became really, really bloated and overcomplicated because anytime I wanted to change anything, I had to manage what was happening in the Maya scene in terms of where those transforms were going and what they were doing. And here, I don't. If I, anytime I want to change how it works, I literally delete it. So there's, no, there's an interesting the question. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, you're reading it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm saying like, like there's definitely, uh, I mean, it's like, it's like 500 lines. It's definitely not, um, I mean, which is not large for a piece of software by any means, but, um, you know, is, is certainly larger than you could display on one screen. I'm just going to show you like bits, the bits of it that are important to maybe understanding how it works. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Raphael. No, no, I was about to say there's an interesting question, which is, is, is the whole system displayed in code on screen right now? Um, but you, you picked up on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so here's, for instance, an F node. Um, and I'm going to just, you know, close the parts that are about connecting it to other nodes. Because these, these just happen, essentially, I call these when I'm creating the nodes, so it figures out what to connect itself to. Because um, literally, this thing right here is the actual transform node. Um, like it's not complicated at all. All it does is on when it gets in, uh, you know, in it, 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 you know, needs some information about what, what's the equivalent Maya node and what's the, you know, what are its transform plugs and stuff. And then when it evaluates, it basically just, um, you know, says, uh, you know, it knows what its driver is. And these, these, uh, um, you know, what these, um, bit, this bit I have here, you know, identifies what the driver of the node should be at this particular moment. And I can get into that a little bit, but I wanted to focus on the eval part of it first. Um, so it knows what the drivers are. It goes, are these drivers dirty? I.e., have they not been evaluated yet? And this is happening every single time the callback, there, there's a callback on the node you're manipulating. And every time that callback fires, i.e., every time the scene refreshes as a result of the user doing something to that node, it's going to run the whole graph. Um, and when it runs, it just tells it just tells the things at the end of the graph to evaluate, and they will go. I mean, this is you know, it's kind of how DG mode in Maya works. They'll go. It basically will evaluate, but in the process of doing that, it has to go evaluate the things it depends on, which have to evaluate the things they depend on until eventually you have evaluated all the things, and then you're done. So, um, can I interrupt you for a sec? <clears throat> sure. Because you say, and you know, in in many ways, these blew my mind because you're you're the missing link you know you're an animator and you decided to turn rigor and then you go and build your own graph it's like i i have immense respect for that um when you say you build your own graph and looking at what you're doing now it's like there's there's a fair chunk of work in there are you when you are you like do you have your own i don't know python objects that represent your nodes and then they have uh you know some way to chain themselves and run the whole thing and the entire implementation is in a callback, so they don't have, other than some parts of the boundaries, the interface, an equivalent as Maya nodes, or is it something else? Can you discuss that, like, even just a little bit to give people context? Sure, sure, yeah, and, 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 and definitely it's good that you ask, because I'm trying, like, I don't have the chance as I'm saying this, the way I do when I'm writing stuff, to be like, okay, how would people understand this and go back and change things, right? I'm kind of going forward through it, and it may be that I skip important parts and some things don't make any sense. Um, so basically, yes, you're, you're pretty much got it right. Like, this F node I have here, this is the, the transform node class, basically, um, that I have. And the graph itself just exists in Python and gets run anytime the callback fires. Um, and... Uh, you know, connects itself, knows, you know, can look up the, to figure out what things to connect it to. To figure that out, I have a bunch of message connections in the scene. So, you know, if I look at, at this control and I look over at the attribute editor, um, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of information that basically says under what circumstances, like I have a bunch of message connections to other nodes in the scene that represent the possible set of connections I could have. They don't do anything, they're just messages. Um, and but dependent on, depending on what I have here, saying what my F constraint type is, I'm going to choose one of those connections to connect myself to, basically. So each, each F node does have a transform node in Maya that is its equivalent, because that's what it has to move around in the Maya scene. And also that to save the data of what are the possible set of different relationships in this rig. Um, and, and I mean, you can make them on the fly. Like, it's, it's fairly freeform. 
you, you don't necessarily you can even call the make make a graph by explicitly telling each node what to connect to instead but um but in terms of uh like the, the way that's worked best for me is I just have these message connections. It runs the graph to figure out what's connected to what and then builds the ephemeral graph off of that. Um, and so when I say that there is an, a, a transform equivalent in Maya for each one of these things, because basically this is a way of having Maya transforms, because what the user is inter moving is a Maya transform. Um, I did, certainly wasn't going to write my own manipulator. Um, uh, move other Maya transforms, but without having any relationship within the node graph. Um, and so the ephemeral, you know, the ephemeral graph runs and then just tells them where to go using this, this thing like apply matrix to plugs, right? You know, this is, this is within eval exactly what's going on here, where I have a little library that I made for myself. Um, I don't even know if I should call this a library. It's so dinky, but it's like, I just took a bunch of OM2 stuff and wrapped it up in some functions that will, you know, take in a matrix and give you either another matrix or a, um, I mean, a, a number of other things, uh, usually another matrix, sometimes the plug, the transform values that you would apply to plugs that are a decomposed matrix. Um, uh, so, so I, here, I want to answer some of these questions here. Uh, so in terms of whether I'm using Maya for animation, I am, but not in the way that you might find common. Um, because the animation that I'm doing is interpolationless, uh, you know, there are keyframes, but sort of conceptually there aren't. The keyframes, um, so I don't know if you saw the, the cartoon on the on the front of the site, it's got that little, that guy in a trench coat that's actually three little guys. That's a, um, a reference to an earlier cartoon I did, which was three keyframes in a trench coat pretending to be a pose. Basically, I want to think about animation at least for 90% of the time that I'm animating. And sometimes you do really need to interpolate at the very end, but for 90% of the time, I want to treat animation as purely as poses. And uh, therefore, I'm going to treat that as basically all of these transform nodes have keys. And, and one of the things I was doing earlier today but had to blow away to get something that I could show was you doing the poses with the system. So that's coming, but the current system would blow up if I tried to make keyframes, but that is easily fixed. Um, the, uh, the keyframes exist only to represent a pose. So they're all step keyed and they all exist for all of these transforms on the same frame. And uh, so in a sense, you could say that I'm not using Maya for animation. I mean, I am, of course. But conceptually, what I'm not doing is using Maya keyframes as keyframes, as they were designed to be used, evaluated in the context of the rig, which I think is very important. Like, all of these things just hang out in world space. The system tells them where to be on a given frame. They get keyed on that frame. They have no relationships to each other, so the whole question of how the rig evaluates from frame to frame, like as you're scrubbing or anything like that, question doesn't even exist. They have a state; they are getting set to that state on that frame. That is all there is. Um, and in terms of the control is connected to the rig via callbacks. Yep, that's exactly it. And I, you know, that's something I really got from Raphael. I did not realize that that would work because I've had so many experiences trying to do strange things with the biograph and having it blow up in your face, right? But actually. Um, and a lot of that was because I wasn't using, oh, you know, I wasn't using uh, API, actually. A lot of that is because I was trying to, like, I did some experiments using, oh, God, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I did some experiments a long time ago using Pymel. Um, uh, but, you know, with the API, if you're saying, um, so here, let me let me go over to the core. <clears throat> and while you do that, the, the question there yeah. was, so the, the control is connected to the rest of the rig via callbacks. And then it's yeah. uh, su such heresy, and this, this is a person we actually know, so the such the such heresy, there's... Oh, okay. I, I think there's some whimsical irony in there, as in I suspect that he approves of the disruption, but I don't know, may maybe yes. he wants to elaborate on that and tell us that, you know, we're a bunch of dirt bags and co yeah. callbacks should never be used. Um. Yeah, well, I mean, believe me, I'm going to be using callbacks for everything. I, I don't, I don't <laughs> care. With, with, it's okay, it's man. <laughs> um, but but here's here's the here's the callback. Um, uh, to total stamp of approval. So you're you're good to go with full chat approval. Yeah. Okay. All right. As long as it's okay with you. Um, so <laughs> so in this particular case, it's a no dirty plug callback. So basically, any time that node and and keeping in mind that since the system gets rebuilt, anytime you change your selection, um, whatever node you have selected at the moment is the node the callback is on because it gets destroyed and recreated anytime you, you move, you select something else. Um, 
Uh, so it basically, anytime that node gets dirty, which happens when the user manipulates the node, um, uh, you know, I mean, or for a variety of other potential reasons, but we don't care about them for this purpose. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, it fires this callback and um, the callback function that's getting fired, basically, you know, it's like, first it dirties the whole graph because I could just say, the graph that I build is the nodes that are in the critical path of whatever the user is manipulating. So I know that every single one of those nodes are, is, is dirty if the callback's firing at all. Um, so I tell them all to be dirty. I tell it to evaluate and it evaluates from the end nodes of the graph. So it starts at, you know, similar to any other sort of like, just like Maya and DG mode, it starts at the end of the graph and works its way back. And I just, I just call the eval graph on it. And then uh, eventually this will do something. Uh, currently I'm not, currently it doesn't, um, but it will, it will someday, someday do auto key will do, will do a thing. Um, but uh, basically, um, right. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's all callback based and in terms of how it sends things back into the graph uh, so it pulls things from the graph I should say I should say that first is that there's there's more than one kind of node so there's an F node there's also a control node and the control node is similar to the F node but when it evaluates all it actually does is to grab its own world matrix again so from the scene so this is the one that the user is manipulating and then it's going to flow down the graph to all of the F nodes and when the F nodes evaluate they they already know what their trans their own transform plugs are in their equivalent transform node in the scene, and it's basically just going to take its own matrix, which is this is super stateful, but it made sense. This it, you know it, it worked. Um, uh, you know basically takes its own matrix and its own transform plugs and applies one to the other, and that sets the scene to be uh, exactly what it ought to be. Yeah. So if those you... are the only two places where it touches Maya. If you need to show code. Like, if you need to show details of code, by the way, you might want to scroll up the size of the font itself. Yeah, but know, I, I, I think I can do that. Oh, there we go. Yeah. C control yeah, scroll right. wheel. That probably yeah. makes more sense. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't think anything was missed out of what you were mentioning. Yeah. Now, I guess I, I have a question about that because, as, as I said before, uh, I, I do consider you the missing link. Now, the fact that you decided to put together your own graph evaluation. I mean, that, that pleases me immensely. And cause, cause one of the things I've been trying to get across, and this is not on stream, this is just in general, is when you look at the basics of some of the things that people think are complicated, uh, I mean, the understanding of the basics and the practice needed to get the intuition can take a while, but there is, I don't find that there is a barrier of entry. A lot of people think, oh, to understand graphs, you know, you need to be really smart and you need to have studied computer science, you need to have studied maths or whatever. And it's like, uh, no, actually, they're quite intuitive. So uh, uh, what I wanted, what I was trying to get to with that is how, when you, when you got into this, how much did you know about graph evaluation? How much theory did you have to look up? Can you go over your... And and I don't know maybe maybe you want to pull your face back up again or maybe there's good sure, sure, salient, yeah, salient points in the code to discuss it, but uh, can you like go over your personal journey on on the grass side? The fact that you're doing, you know, imposter syndrome and all, you go like, oh, I don't know if we, you know, if I can call it a library. Yes, you can. It is. It's definitely a library. Uh, you're you're not appropriating. You know. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm sure you get what I'm saying. It's a really small one. It's like a page and a half. Right? That is a good library. Okay. Um, and all, all that library does is do stuff like, this is how you multiply a matrix by another matrix. This is like how you aim one matrix at a point in space. Like, you know, the really, really basic stuff. All of which, by the way, I'm not doing the math myself. I'm using the various OM classes in OM2 to, you know, um, so the, the various M classes, rather. To, to just do the math because they were available and they already did it, so it worked. Um, but uh, the, um, right, so so uh, w basically, so here's, I think, an interesting thing, because I really didn't understand, like, I don't have any theory, really. Um, what I did understand about graphs is I've been dealing with the Maya node graph for a long time. Um, and I understood that it was in some ways idiosyncratic, right? It has its weird issues. But the basic concept of you have nodes, 
and data flows through the nodes in a particular way. This is something that I just had had to deal with as a rigger anyway. So I had some intuitive understanding of like what that meant. And then a lot of the rest of it was basically that, um, I mean, I really didn't know if it was gonna work when I started when I started programming this. I really was like, I don't know. I kind of had this alternate idea of trying a different way of sort of faking Maya into doing it. But I guess one of the things that's really worth saying about this is there's, I mean, I mean, there, there, there is something to be said for quick and dirty solutions to things, but it's um, using what exists and sort of kit bashing it into place all, also has the possibility of, of just really, really, really screwing you over. Um, and uh, I think that that has largely been true of rigging that it's, that it's designed, you know, it's sort of like evolved in a weird way uh, into these sort of tools that were built on other tools that weren't really even intended to do with the first, you know, what, the, what they're actually being used for. And, um, uh, and that there's a place for that, but in this case, it, it, it was shocking to me how much easier it was to do this as just pure code than it was to try to, and, and this is what I mean when I say like, uh, you know, there's there's a pathological fear of code. Um, it's it's like, you're already doing something more complicated than this if you're doing most conventional rigging, you know? So I we just <coughs> somebody came up with a question here. Um, so, so not to implement this to node. So actually, it's really important that it not be a Maya node. Um, so I think I'm just responding to what Victor is saying. Um, uh, the reason why it's important that it's not a Maya node is that it creates behavior that, although it's not cyclic in any given moment. Sorry, um, can you repeat repeat the question first, if you can? Oh, oh of course. I'm sorry. Because pe people that watch it on YouTube right. won't so, have so Victor, the context asking, of the chat. Why did you decide not to implement this as a node? So that you participate in general DAG evaluation and your nodes compute is your subgraph evaluation. The reason why I decided not to do that, me, meaning the qu the question is, well, you can write your own node in Maya, and then you use the Maya node graph, and it can have whatever outputs you want and whatever inputs you want. So why not just make this a Maya node? The reason is that I explicitly want to get away from Maya's rules about how Maya's graph behaves. Um, I think that those are. Um, because uh, because I, I am participating in Maya's graph evaluation cycle in that I am, you know, a, the 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 um, the callback that says go do this now comes from Maya's own evaluation, but um, uh, but the actual the, the the problem with Maya's evaluation is that thing of like it's this it's this state it's a state machine right it's um I hope I'm using that term correctly but I'm pretty sure I am um. It's, uh, you know, you've got that node and it has specific inputs and specific outputs. And what I'm doing here, the inputs and outputs are in a sense changing completely because I destroy and recreate the graph. And that allows me to very easily create this effect of, uh, you know, behavior that seems cyclic, uh, even though it, uh, it isn't in any given moment, right? You know, uh, I'm not breaking cycles here, though I could. Um, uh, but I can, uh, I can, you know, anytime you're moving stuff around, you can then go move something else that affects the first thing, and that's easy to do and not a problem, um, uh, because because the whatever graph previously existed has now been destroyed, and I don't really see a good way of doing that that participates fully in the Maya node graph, or I should say, uses the Maya node graph's machinery. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's some way to make it work, and. Um, you know, I think that the exo the exo cortex node, for instance, um, exo constraint. Sorry, exo cortex is a different thing. Um, uh, the exo constraint node, um, uh, for instance, um, which I, I forget. Like you can Google that. I don't remember off the top of my head what the address is, but um, is an example of someone doing a similar thing. But they're they're sort of using the Maya graph a lot a lot more than I am. Like it's actually represented as actual actual sort of always on relationships but i think that for my purposes doing it that way is just drastically drastically more complicated the advantage that i have here is i just get to be like i don't even care you know like if this graph was doing something that is now the wrong thing that's fine i just deleted it anyway you know um as opposed to having to manage and figure out how to make all the data fl flow in the right direction when all of your nodes always exist and are always connected in a given way I have a question, like following up with um, what uh, Raf, uh, Raf is saying. It's uh, Rafael, you, you commented in, in uh, some uh, Cult of Rig uh, videos uh, where you like to, uh, Rick, uh, to let Rick. So 
I think it's a similar approach, no? Where you, 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 instead of put all your behavioral in this complex graph on inside Maya, trying to balance everything, or you do tool your rig in a way that some of the behavior is get through this system, the callbacks, or maybe some temporal graph or something like that, like similar to what- Yeah, uh, so did. that's that's one of the many reasons. And it sounds like I'm sucking up to Raph, like this, throughout this oh. thing. But I mean, there's, there's a reason if I, you know, if I want to you guys in this, because uh, I, I really like the idea and I think that, you know, a lot, as I said before, a lot of people suffer, especially people that are good at what they're doing, I find suffer of, you know, some, to some degree of some form of imposter syndrome. Um, I, I like what Raf is doing a lot because there's, to me, what I've been saying on the code, there are two parts to a rig and one is almost always ignored. Uh, and for the record, the person that asked that question was actually uh, happy with the reply. And I agree, with, I agree with that assessment, which is one is the graph evaluation, which is what Maya itself abuses. So, and yes, the word state machine is not, uh, without quibbling on the detail, it's, it's not bad for it. You are largely, the way the Maya graph works, you're largely looking at a massive state container with the state altering mechanism, which is the edge expanding the graph, uh, determining what is going on. And if you're looking at the DG mode, it can do some absolutely ungodly things to evaluation. Parallel, you know, constrains the domain a little bit more. And so this, this is a long preface to, I guess, what I'm trying to say, which is what RAF is doing, which I'm, I'm a huge fan of, and it's the same thing that I do with containers as interfaces or a number of other things, is with the interpolation list thing, he's constraining the domain. He's saying, uh, my animation isn't going to be a mass of, uh, like what, what you were trying to say, I guess, when you say, you know, there's, in a way you're not using my animation, you're not using sparse animation, you're culling out entire parts of the feature set of Maya with all the problems. Same reason why I don't use pivots or a number of other things. Everything is on the beat at all times. So by that constraint, you can make a lot of things happen. You can make a lot of things more reliable. And yes, you give up some features such as interpolation, but if your style of animation fits it, that's okay. And it's the same for the rig. There's, there's a time where you go like some of the stuff that animators want, if you express it as a graph is maliciously uh, cyclic and you cannot solve it so then people build these enormous constructs that either approximate the solution that people would actually like to use or sometimes even worse actually do put together some evaluation solutions that has so many gaps that at some point it has some issues that falls in between the cracks maya loses it and then suddenly it's not cyclic anymore because you have literally messed up with the state of the state machine. And they go like, yeah, I got it to work. I've seen tutorials like that. If you use this weird trick and you wire things up like that, and I, I remember quite a lot of those uh, back in the day when people didn't know much about the graph underlying. You're talking like very early 2K. I was looking at it and I was horrified um because you go like you you you're not even exploiting a side effect which is bad enough you you are literally predicating your entire feature on a misbehavior of a graph that hopefully they will fix so and that manipulation context is where manipulators and tools and stuff like that should come in so if something is cyclic if something cannot be expressed as a graph it should not be expressed as a graph and that's what raf is doing and his answer to Victor uh, can be sort of surmised in, I want to change the topology considerably. I don't just want to change, uh, you know, maybe what the critical path for a static topology is. I literally want to be able to, depending on the options, create a topology that is ad hoc. Um, I don't know. I like it. So sorry, it's... Um, it's a rigging version of the ascent of man. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, the gym pool of riggers needs widening. Oh, man. Yeah, we'd all love that. So anyway, sorry, that distracted. <laughs> um, yeah, but so yeah, sorry. Also, that's that's a long answer to that question. It took me more than a minute. It took three. But hopefully hopefully that makes sense. And that's, that's why I like, you know, what Raf is doing. 
So, so I, there, there was like three questions in here I want to like try to answer quickly so they don't like get too sidetracked. But number one, um, uh, in terms of how the system works right now, uh, it's sort of uh, it's sort of like separate from because because it's unrelated to the Maya graph. Questions of parallelism in terms of parallel eval aren't even relevant, right? It runs first, then the Maya graph does whatever it does with its own you know parallel or otherwise stuff. Um, uh, in terms of like if you now, th now, now, you know, this is, I don't really, frankly, I don't really see much of, while I think that it might be worth writing a version of ephemeral rigging in C++ instead of Python, I really don't see much of a reason to parallelize it because it's actually really, really, really simple. Like, um, because you only have or have the one path through things, right? I mean, I'm already getting really performant frame rates and, like, stuff out of my really simple, non-optimized version. I don't really think it's going to be a big problem. I think parallel parallel is going to matter a whole lot more in other aspects of rigging than it is in sort of the ephemeral control rigging um although who, who knows maybe if you want to have a whole bunch of because because you don't you don't need it for playback too that's another thing to point out that the ephemeral just doesn't operate at all when you're playing back because you already have all the data of where the notes are um so in the quest as to the question of uh you know it seems like art is more old school art is really a totally different thing actually in fact what i was just showing you with that character it's also an art character um, it's, uh, you know, all the deformations being handled by art. So basically you could say that ephemeral rigging is a, you know, a, an attempt to make a real change to how control works, and art is an attempt to make a real train, change to how um, uh, deformation works. And the reason why art is taking so long is simply because making a product that you can actually release is just a huge amount of work, um, <laughs> actually. And, um, you know, it's been in a state where a person who knew how to use it could use it for a long time, but bringing that to a point where it's like, okay, we could actually release the thing. We have a good manual. You know, we've squashed bugs that you know I just knew how to work around, but you can't release it like that. You know, you know, we've tested it in under various conditions. Like, there's so much stuff, and we're just sort of slowly working our way through it because you know it's just a lot to deal with uh, for people who don't do it as their day. Like, it's not our day job, right? But um, but it is it is definitely coming out. Um, uh, and and I think that, that what it does is very complementary to ephemeral rigging. They're they're not really like a, an older or newer method of doing things. Um, uh, like, uh, could you control add controls mid animation to an ephemeral rig? Yeah, you could. I mean, actually, if anything, it would work pretty well for that um, because it you know since since all the connections between things, <clears throat> like I I just have this store in the in the scene of like oh there's these there's these. Uh, message connections and uh, they tell it what types of graphs it can build and you could change those in the middle of a shot if you wanted to there's no reason why not um, and I think that uh, I think that that answers I, I think that answers all the questions over there okay. yeah do, do we want to give it over to Miguel for a little bit of yeah, a yeah. gear oh well yeah you're it's sorry man really is it too sudden? <laughs> yeah. I feel like yeah. you were like, you were cruising and yeah, enjoying no, I, the conversation, I, I yeah. and um, and then we sprung these on you. The... Okay. Um, what... I'm trying to share my screen. Where is the button? Sorry, where is? Do you see there is a plus here, or this is Skype? I. No, we're know. on um, Hangouts. Hangout? So I think that on the top right, you should have three vertical dots, and that's where share screen is. I... Oh, yeah. There. Okay, because I'm, I'm hosting, but yeah, Sorry. I was checking the now. It's like that. Yeah, now. Okay, I guess now I'm sharing yeah. the screen. Okay, yeah, well, um, I, I think the most, I mean, what. Raf did on, on the ephemeral rig it's really really interesting and and here it's uh, more of the same thing <laughs> I mean I don't <laughs> I don't know if it's some juice to to like interest uh, to show it here and probably you can see many of this stuff already on on the uh, in gear channel thing um, but yeah I want to point uh, just making a, a little um, r review of what I say before like the way that I'm approaching these things on, on the design. So here you have all the, the guides that's typical for modular rigging system. So nothing new here. Like you have all these lists with many, many components. But you can see here I, I have components that repeat itself, like uh, three arms and FK chains. I have a bunch of them. And some of them are revealed like legs. I have many legs. 
And the reason is like that I, it's try to keep everything as simple as possible. So, and for an example here, just let me make this a little bigger. Well, it's not important, the code itself. But here I have one that I call light chain, and here is the chain FK spline. So basically, there are two, two chains to rig whatever you need from a finger to a strand or whatever. And the thing is, the interface itself, the guide, it's almost the same. Indeed, you can build one from the other, just changing, pointing to the new uh, different um, elements. So you can see here on the minimap, uh, it's, it's almost same length of code. It has some options and the EFK is plain that doesn't have on the light. But then when you go to the, the real code, the, the code that the, uh, this, the so it's, this is the light one, but it's just a simple loop and nothing else. And this is just helping some connections. And if you go for the spline, you can see it's way longer because there are more options. So this it's, uh, I, I see many people like, having this uh, over-engineer system where they have thousands of lines of code of having many, many options on the on the component. And then when you need to, to update the component and change something, it becomes very complex because the, um, the, the I mean, just by, by the size of the, the, of the, of the code, no? But here it's like, okay, I, I could probably do the light version inside the chain or, or, or another version because I have like FK, IK and things like that. But instead of do that, I, I just take one. Oh, sorry, I thought it was something with me. Um, so just to put an example, where is my, so if I create my chain, FK is playing, but the default attributes is here. You have some bunch of settings that the other one doesn't have it. But you can build this. So boom, and it builds. And it has some elements here that is, if I hide the joints, you can see this element like that does this, like very spline oriented thing. But if, and this is a bit of a hack here, but here, I, I am saying this is the chain of case uh, spline something. So if I change this to light, okay. like this, and the interface when I build in is the same, it's this, this thing. So, and now I'm pointing to the light version that uh, is this one. So now with the same guide, the same structure is building the other one. So that's, that's the, the approach. So here, uh, uh, Jeremy did a really nice design on the previous version on, on soft image where you, you have con compatibility on between components. And here it's not really well exposed, but you have this kind of compatibility. Uh, obviously these have more options than the light version. So if I try to do the same from light uh, to the complex one, it's gonna error out, but there is some way to, to you can upgrade the, the guide. So if I do this, um, let me, uh, where is the light? Here, again. So, and I want to convert this to chain. So FK, so let me put here chain. It's pointing to the new component. Whoops. Fine, like this. So now, um, build this, it's gonna say, hey, you don't have these elements here. What's what's wrong with you? So it, you see the the kind of the the positions and the guide is the same, but not, don't have the same thing here. So you just need to to update the guide. So it, it will take care of that. And Sorry, can I can I interrupt you for a second, Miguel? Yes, absolutely. Because I, I think this this part is up to something. So uh, for those of us, and I have to admit, I'm sorry, I haven't used them here. But um, you know, in in my defense, I've never used any rigging system at all <laughs> other than my own uh, it sounds you're talking about interfaces uh which is cool and interface compatibility it's not super clear if you mean interfaces in the programming sense if you mean the guide can you elaborate for like uh, concisely i guess on what the guide is and where these interfaces come into place interfaces are normally interstitial you have two things that are the meat 
and the way they contact each other you know that's that's the interface and that's where compatibility issues arise and all of that uh it sounds like there's an interesting bit in there yeah well the the, the the point that I was trying to make is like uh, is more going over uh, the over engineer and debugging and maintenance of the of the elements that uh, compose or build your your uh, your rigs. So and how it's easier to keep the things simple and have some common interface to this instead of over engineer one uh, element or one component that does all the possible situations that you may need. I don't know if oh, that makes sense that. Yes, it does. So you, you're talking about doing many, you know, non-inheriting specializations instead of trying to cover every possible combination with one massive set that inevitably becomes intricate yes. and unmaintainable. So when you say interface though, I think that, that still is worth talking about. Uh, and when you're talking about guides, so this, this an interesting question in chat you've grouped your components based on shared guides like that's that's the question um is that is that the case because that that would be an interesting discriminant is the guide kind of the parameters of the guide kind of give you the taxonomy of the components and how they can be divided and yeah kind of uh like if you have chains whatever your chain is it like this one if you think on the on the guide itself, Oops. it's no difference between one of the other or the other one, the uh, ch the regular chain. So if I do this uh, chain that is uh, IKFK version of this one, um, from outside you cannot distinguish the, the the placement interface. But if you go to the to the attribute itself or the settings, you will see that this uh, this is a general thing for all components. But here you can see the options are different for each one. So as far as the the elements of the guide itself are the same, so the guided placement and position thing is the same, the attributes that you, you call here and you configure your guide can be changed from one to another. And right now it's not really well exposed. I don't, and, and, and if you use the soft, soft image gear version, you have a Dropbox menu where you, you have com compatibility uh, components. I didn't implement that here, but uh, you still can ha do that if you know which one is going with which one. So it's a bit of a hacking right now. But um, my point here was not like going to hack this thing and uh, the visual thing, but more talking about in the back end how, how it's handled this, that it's instead of having these options there, like just to keep it simple as possible. And sometimes, I, 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 uh, this one was the first that it came, was original, uh, like, uh, um, from soft image, so have IKFK thing, very simple. And then I, I had the need to have one that have spring or the, the, you know, and this is something that's different. And then I, I did this one more complex with IKFK for certain like tails or things like that. And then I, I figured out, okay, I need one live because many, in many cases, it's just like one simple chain that y you want to be very light and you're going to put many of them in a character for any reason. So why you go here and start adding or removing options to to make simple version when you can just straight out have a simple version design and just make it work with that just with a simple pointing or simple change of the pointing of where I am, i'm building here so to, to present the so, devil's advocate for the record I'm, I'm a fan of early specialization and you know flat libraries uh the, the devil's advocate counterpoint to that if you want these, uh, what happens when there's there's this interface, which in your case seems to be the guide. The guide does seem to provide, you know, at least a root taxonomy value divide things. When you need to change that guide, uh, and you have four components that conform to that guide, how well isolated and modular is that? How easy is it to change one guide and automatically or easily propagate that to like the four components that use that guide as a taxonomy point? Um, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Like if if I change the, the guide itself, like, uh, like say I want all like 
it's uh, the chain FK thing, like this one is gonna be chain FK and this one is gonna be chain FK, like this. So or do you mean like the guide? The guide itself has some features, I imagine, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that the riggers don't like the way the guide is configured. Uh, you know, may maybe initially you had a guide for spine and, and it was FK like, so you move, you know, you move the shoulder and the entire arm goes up. Uh, actually, if you look at the guide for the feet in Cult of Rig, is mm -hmm. like for the legs, it's it's kind of the opposite where you go. Like, most of the time, people want to move there and move there and like IK like behavior, place their guide from the ends and they go towards the inward. Rarely they want the FK. Let's say you've done an FK guide and then you need to change the behavior of the guide itself. Mm -hmm. How then people expect that change to ripple out to all the components that use the same guide. Then I might be misunderstanding the system. Maybe the guide is not taxonomical here. No. Um, well, one of the, I, I think if I grasp the, the, the question is like, for instance, if I want to change my light chain to do something different, like for instance here, this light chain, if I scale one of the elements, um, it's gonna have sharing on the, on the next uh, element of the chain and the regular chain doesn't. So let's say I want to add the same behavior to this chain one, uh, the light one, sorry. So probably what I will do is it's, if I have to do it in the middle of a project, uh, I'm just gonna duplicate my chain one, ch put chain two and add this behavior there, like changing the, the, the code itself and then pointing which elements I want to use the new uh, behavior and rebuilding the rate. So that will be the um, the approach there. If I want to change like this kind of uh, configuration on the on the guy, this was it the question like you, you asked like. Uh, no, no, the question is sort of open ended. It's you know when when you have dependencies in software and you you update something at the base, do you track dependencies? You know what's the relationships? And no, I don't. It's too much of a hassle. Is a perfectly valid answer for the record of, you know. Yeah, probably. I, yeah, no. I was, I, I, I was curious. And, and also, like, if you change, for instance, if I have <clears> this, that it's, uh, let's say, it's the FK uh, is playing, and I have some elements here, like keep length thing, and then I change and update my guide to the simple one, and I update everything. So this is going to clean up the elements that are not integrated on the light version. Then I go back to the, the, the full version or the, the most complex version. Whatever I configure that was not shared by the two guides is lost. I don't track that also. So you need to be conscious of that. But there's uh, something yeah. that, to be honest, it, does, it doesn't happen that often. Normally, what it happened, it's like you normally start with the most basic situation and then uh, you need to add more stuff. <laughs> That's always that direction, like 99% of the time. It's like, I did this super basic, and then you need to, to add for X reasons this and this. So it goes to add, so you don't lose what you have because you're adding. But yeah, of course, there is uh, bottlenecks and uh, trade-offs and yeah. Yeah, so it's you're, you're like super well, it's how it should be, I guess. You know, you're, you're advocating for a start simple because some people don't do that. Some people start with the most complex possible you know, do it all combination and then they will try and turn off some bits as needed. Yes, exactly. So that's, um, that's the, um, yeah, what I, I try is like yeah, to keep it as much simple as possible. So, and, and always like, I, I remember as some conversations, like, uh, talking about, oh, what do you think is a good rig and thing? I want uh, that's, uh, it's a uh, million like answers question. No. Some people would say it's deformation, evaluation, manipulation. And what I see in many rigging uh, demo reels. Oh, we're losing Miguel a bit or we're losing me? I think, I think we're, I'm, I'm losing him a bit too. Yeah, he's, he's, either he's incredibly yes. steel. Oh, there you go. We, we lost you for about 30 seconds, Miguel. So you were uh, saying sorry, um, what, what a lot of riggers oh, do, the, and then we I lost you there. My, uh, I have a crazy face on this. Stuck on me. I got it. Uh, and I was, um, uh, I don't know where 
where you lose me. Uh, can, can you make point me where, where I? Uh, you you were saying a, a lot of rigging them reels and what a lot of riggers do, and then you froze frame. Uh, yeah, they it, they add a ton of features and everybody must have the the, the bendy arms and the squash and stretches and blah blah blah. And you go to the demo reels and you see all the like look I do this I look that I do that and that, 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 that. And that's great. I mean, it's 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 good to know all this stuff. But at the end of the and in production, I will try to avoid um, as much as I can these things or have the flexibility to 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 edit that in in the fly or well, not in the fly, but you know, like to cook in your your asset over and over to to don't uh, need to, to to put everything and then uh, just in case. No? So you just put the minimum and build again. Sorry, so I was I my question. my oh, chuckle sorry. was for a question that's in chat and say like, Riggs is a software. I definitely agree with the concept. Uh, I can't help but feel the whole idea is more once you hamstring it using Maya or any DCC really, kind of like giving somebody a copy of Visual Studio and a dictionary. <laughs> I, I kind of agree with them. Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest and it's like I don't know if I agree with that. Um, but that's possibly because everybody, especially, you know, we've had a chat before. It's like rigs as a software. It's like it's a good catchy thing to, you know, to have a fireside chat over it. But I mean, it's there's, there's nothing definite about the notion of rigs as software. I don't I don't think it applies. I mean, even if you don't necessarily write code. And if anything, Maya's problem is that it's kind of tough to really get it to do interesting stuff without writing a lot of code. Like personally, I don't know how I would go about things without, I'm, I'm, I know how I go about things without C++ in Maya, which is how I do on the code. It takes me five times and, you know, five times as, as much time and about 18 to 28 times the amount of frustration. Uh, whereas nor normally if I, if I'm at work doing my own stuff, I'll, half the time I will have Visual Studio and a dictionary and just, you know, blaze my way through a problem. Um, I don't know. It's it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, I almost feel like I wish to one where we have the audience on Hangouts. But you, you were about to say that you agree, Raph, so I'm, I'm curious about that. I mean, I mean that. I am, although I don't want to cut into Miguel's time, and I also had a question for him of my own. But I, I will just say really briefly, the thing that I kind of agree about is that, at least right now, I'm really interested in this idea of, you know, things in some ways become much simpler when you're just like, all right, these are matrices, right? I'm going to do something to a matrix. I'm going to use some quaternions. I'm going to get a result out of it. I'm not going to worry about all the things that surround that that are specific to this DCC. And so that's why I'm kind of like, I kind of agree about the idea that um, you're a little bit hum hamstrung by, by having to look at things through the prism of your particular DCC and its particular way of doing mm. things. There is a more generalizable idea here. I mean, that's kind of, you know, um, uh, so that, that's kind of what I meant by that. But um, what I wanted to ask you, Miguel, which I think is a similar thing to what someone else here, Wobbly Bob, was actually asking, um, uh, which is basically uh, you were, so so this is a situation where you've, you've um, You've had to create something that uh, started out as XSI, and you've ended up you've ended up doing it in Maya. You're trying to preserve some of the same basic concepts, even though obviously the two applications are really different from each other in a lot of ways. Is there like a core aspect of it that's like, um, you know, doing the uh, the sort of inner like what, what, whatever inner whatever inner stuff happens in MGear, right? That that is relatively portable or are you essentially having to really re-architect what you're doing and in terms of in terms of how it gets information from the not like you've got you've got guides and you have a and you have a, a fairly um well-developed system for pushing information from them onto other components and stuff how much of this basically is sort of internal to m gear and how much of it is specific i guess is the question well, the, the the first thing I want to say is that uh, I have to give credit to Jeremy. He is the the original designer of all the uh, the system itself, uh, and he did the the soft image version and he started porting it to to Maya. And um, I I can say that it's um, many of the lines. If you if you open, you can get the repo for a soft image. It's still, uh, I have one copy on my uh, GitHub, and you, you have the, the the Maya one. 
and some of the lines you can see it's almost copy pasted like honestly some of the uh, of the code and libraries and and some of the elements so we have also a library for transformations and if you see the the i mean it's almost the same it's just pointing to um a different like one it's in 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 subtimation it's using the, the python in in uh, in maya we're using pymel mainly for uh, all the the builders and all this stuff but the the it's it's i mean you can put side by side and maybe use the uh this um uh, melt or something to compare code and and you will see that it's not that different a part of the conventions that was the first iteration and in, in mgr1 uh then uh uh, after I realized, like some of the, like, um, like uh, naming conventions that was using Softimage di didn't make the uh, clear for this Maya users, so I start to make it more Maya-like these things. So, for instance, the in Softimage you call properties in Maya you say settings and things like that. In in Softimage we 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 had like what we call the shadow organization or so or. Sh <laughs> That was basically Softimage. You can use any object to to bind the geometry. I, I think in Maya you can do it, but it's a bit tricky. That normally you use joins. Uh, like so if you want to piss me off, just mention about the fact that Maya seems to think that joints <laughs> and transforms should never be treated as the same thing, like in terms of the GUI and stuff. And I'm just like, what's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah. it took me it took me a while to grasp that. So I um, I start to making more Maya naming conventions things. So the, my joints at the beginning was called SHD shadow because it's just a, something I used to deform. Now it's called joint. So people understand. And the other thing like, um, like was very specific for Maya, for instance, is the way that Maya builds the, I mean, when I come to Maya the first time and I see all these tutorials on joint orientation, oh my God, that's hell. That's what the, I mean, the joint orientation thing, it, it's, it's, I mean, that's a punishment for something that Maya people did in the <laughs> past that you need to, to pay for the rest of your life or what? I mean, honestly, I don't get it. It sounded like I, I, a I great think, idea in 94. I'm sure it did. I, I think we could have a whole conversation that's basically like original sins of Maya, like yeah. things that Maya did wrong in the mid nineties yeah. that have just like compounded and compounded and become worse and worse and worse. And so one of the, I, uh, things that I did is as as soon as I understood how that thing works is get rid of that so I the way I work I never have to orient the joints I never take care I mean it's automatically done the way that it builds all are oriented uh, to, to get reset position on orientation and the transformation you cannot do it so it's whatever your, your translation I'm sorry translation you have but everything is zero out for you on the rotation and pointing and everything and the bind post so you can export to games or you can do whatever you want like drive uh, rbf nodes from there or other kind of uh mm -hmm. helper joins to the formation from this uh but i don't deal with that anymore and the people say ah oh, but if you want to reorient your joints like well, i don't want to reorient your joints i don't want to touch the joints <laughs> you know it's, it's uh, so things like that so yeah, there was a, a bit of one-to-one -one conversion at the beginning and slightly oriented and, and start more being specialized on the um, on Maya way of doing some things because it's just simple, easier. I, I was considering to, to support several VCCs and still op the door is open. But uh, to be honest, um, I wish there was more real alternative in the market like uh, you have real ones i mean uh, don't misunderstand me but uh, when it mean in market means like when i search for uh, rigging jobs <laughs> i don't see too much rigging offers yeah or gigs in other software so that's that's when it's main market there's I think. there's no real alternative that's one of the problems and it's it doesn't mean that my is the best but uh, anyway i don't i don't want to upset you know Software yeah, fans, I think I'd, I, I, yeah. If I can say something, I, I've been Softimage users since Softimage 3D. I mean, like, and, and I was super like 
bitter with Maya at the beginning, like, you know, like everything is new, like new shoes, I mean, these shoes are super uncomfortable, doesn't fit my, my foot. <laughs> but then when you start using it, I, I kind of like it, man. And I, I never did better rigs than now. And, and, and I never been faster as now. And, and my, compared to Softimage, the Softimage has said really great things. And I really like some of the uh, things that he had. But it, when I go back to Softimage, now I'm unhappy anywhere. It's just like <laughs> I, well, I see the bright sides and the dark. So no, no, I know. But like the problem is they kill soft image, and I, I, I know what you mean. It's uh, but the, the alternative thing, the, the problem with it. And sorry if I'm interjecting here, but it's it kind of pisses me off as well. I mean, no, normally it's it's a mild enough form of swearing that I think I can say piss off in the stream. It's uh, there's several things that you want out of a DCC application for rigging and for the longest time only soft image and Maya kinda got it. Houdini has some amazing stuff, but when you consider offering as well as consumption, as well as the market facing aspect, like can I can I recruit and train people for it? And you know, and I've worked at places that were soft image when everybody else was Maya, and I've worked at places that use Maya when everybody was still in soft image three D. So I've, I've been in that, but it was never really much of a problem. It was it was always a psychological and political problem to train across the two, yeah. but it, it was never really it never really costed much money. But with soft image gone and with only Maya out there. When you look at applications that let you control the graph and let you alter that graph, uh, like what, what you're doing and how intuitively you are doing it with the ephemeral rig, an example graph, like fabric could have been the alternative. And, you know, and that's, that's gone. That's been sold to party unknown. Uh, I don't know if, if there is an alternative, somebody let me know, please. And I, and I think that we are the problem. The problem are animators and rigging TDs. They have, have never, not enough rigging TDs, not enough animators have been willing to see the status quo shaken. Uh, and again, that's why I like what Raf is doing, you know, as, as that missing link. And not enough TDs have ever really understood the basics of rigging and you know and the the craft of it i feel to to appreciate what to look for in a system i guess and to be able to move across and say rigging is the only the rigging and animation performance call it is the only discipline the only one that doesn't have a dedicated application no application managed to get into that market ever fabric didn't manage reflex didn't manage to get a user base uh, what's its face? Uh, well, all the motion capture, baked in rig things, you know, Siga Animanium, Messiah. It's like, and then the, yeah, when right. you look at it, they were all fabric was coming off soft image, Messiah was coming off light wave. And it's like every software is at this splinter cell yeah, that well, tried to tackle that market. And we're, we're dumb. We're a bunch of I dumb mean, asses that never try yeah, new things. I, I think a lot of that has yeah. to do with the simple fact that there just aren't actually, I mean, we're just so small, right? It's like, who cares about, who really cares and understands yeah. character animation and the technology that's surrounded? And not all that many people, right? And so, um, I mean, I've, I've really felt like, all right, you know, if there was a bigger market, somebody would have come in and done something better, just like people did with rendering and modeling and like, you know, there was there was multiple, dis you know, serious disruptions and things got a lot better, right? Like modeling is totally different than it was 15 years ago. Oh. So it was rendering, right? Like completely. Um, and animation is basically the same thing, which is which is ridiculous in a lot of ways. Um, oh. I mean, I think a lot of it also has to come down to the fact that because of that, because, you know, it, it really astonished me, for instance. And I don't mean, like, I, I guess I'm kind of hogging the, the, the time too. Like this is sort of, like you know let me know if you want to jump back in here Miguel. Uh, but just one I, I don't want to interrupt you you I, I have five minutes I have to bring my son to the to the bus to the school mm -hmm. so but yeah uh, continue please uh. oh okay um the uh man no sorry, <laughs> sorry uh, okay I just uh, you know I'm a little tired I so today, I mean um, it's it's getting late for everybody do we want to do Miguel's closing notes so that he can 
dash out and um, perform fatherly duties and then we move on to mine and yours because yep. we've been believe I it or not we've sense. been going for almost two hours not yeah, unexpectedly I probably need to leave in like 10 minutes myself actually all right so i'll only be able to say like a couple of closing things and i'll because we, we started the, going on a ranting tangent and i blame myself for part of that so it's like I, I'm, I'm, the funniest part. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, it's, Rambling. yeah, but it's, it's got to degrade into the, any, any good, you know, podcast, vidcast, whatever has to eventually degrade into ramblings. Do you have closing notes, Miguel? This, is there anything uh, you, you want to tell people? Is there anything you want to ask or get asked from the audience? Mm, and then I'll pile uh, up the questions for you, Brad. I, I don't know for this topic. Well, there, there is, of course we can keep talking and talking for hours and but yeah, um, <laughs> I, I think we did great points here, and and, and at least to, to, to show uh, like the, the, the ideas that uh, come to to this uh, like podcast reading uh, uh, as a software. Um, honestly, I, I think the uh, rough work it's 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 fantastic, and I'm, I'm really eager to, to put my hands on that thing. And yeah. and um, I don't know, I, I just um, thinking like I, I'm like. This is really what I mean. It's different. It's it's something that um, it's thinking out of the box and 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 yeah, and can be done perfectly in, in any DCC or even in the future. Maybe has its own little self-contained DCC because it's just uh, a matter of uh, like time that maybe it's it's easier to uh, to do that in other like elements like not Maya, but. But the concept itself, I think it's really great. Uh, on my side, I, I think I'm more focused on other uh, aspects of the uh, the rigging itself, not like to more, unless not to be um, that like out of the box, more tackling what, what it's the, the common thing. So uh, I don't think I have too much to add on this area, but yeah, but under the workflow and the way that you approach the rigging as a software and maintenance and and like team management and things like that that's uh something that it's also like rigging as a software and i think it's very important to know there but yeah that's it thank you so much for the opportunity and i hope we can repeat this uh in the future with maybe some topics or catching up with uh how we did with our stuff after it, a few months on, on it sounds channel. like we might have to because just just about everybody in private messages and in chat was saying yeah this, this needs to be a, to be continued <laughs> so apparently a lot of people can actually endure for like two two hours of stereotypical white man ranting that's remarkable i can like, i totally underestimated the resilience of the average person <laughs> <laughs> well clearly clearly our uh our um, stream viewers here are not mere, are, they are not average people. <laughs> they're capable of withstanding extraordinary. Yeah, strength. well, they're, they're Riggers, and Riggers are known yeah. to be resilient to pain. Yeah. Also, well done, pander to the audience. It's it's yeah, always good. You. So, uh, well, well, let's you go, Miguel. Th yeah. Thanks a lot for yeah, sorry. coming and playing. Because, uh, maybe uh, I will I will check while I come back, if you're still talking, I uh, maybe rejoin. No, no, I have, I have a doctor appointment very soon, and then I gotta go to work, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, well, so you have to, no, oh, sorry, yes. you have to get your, yeah. your kid to school, like mine has bedtime, so that's why, yeah. Yeah, sorry so much, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, don't, don't well, worry about it. So thank you again, and well, see you on the chat yeah. and on the interwebs. Th thanks a lot, and we'll, we'll do it again. Yeah. See you, Miguel. Bye-bye. So, Ref, have you yeah. got closing foods? I mean, you have quite a few. I mean, I uh, guess I'd like to answer whatever questions are there that I haven't answered. Um, uh, Yes, once a man has skinned in Maya, he endures. That's right. Um, <laughs> There's quite a few. I mean, yeah. you, you, you can pick whatever you want. If any sure. of them is, is good for a segue into a closure, if not, just answer one of them and then we yeah, say goodbye. I, I'm, I'm going to just maybe, like, there's been some questions that sort of touch on the on the interpolationless rigging question, which is, you know, something that's, you know, at, at some point I'm going to be able to use the ephemeral system and do a piece of animation and I'll, just like I did with the monkey back in the, you know, a little while ago, I'll record myself doing it and people will maybe get a better sense of what the full sense of it is. But, you know, basically, um, basically there's a couple of questions here, uh, including, um, uh, 
if the base data state of your new breaking idea is consistent keys, it's con sorry, constant keys, and the inherent problem is that animators need their curves, why are you not just building fitting the curves to those keys? Which is a similar question to one that was just asked, which is um, how do the F transforms keyframes represent in the graph editor for the animators? So there's a number of ways that one might choose to relate this kind of interaction with a rig to interpolation. My chosen way is to not do so. Um, because, and this is this is like a very sort of disruptive weird thing, one that cannot be applied at least currently to all situations. I actually don't want to interpolate at all. I want to use um, uh, onion skinning and breakdown tools, which are, I mean, of course a breakdown tool kind of does interpolate, but it's not continuous interpolation, to essentially create, uh, create in between semi-manually and animate very much like I'm a drawn animator because I think this is artistically beneficial and makes a whole bunch of the problems associated with how do you represent stuff like this with, with you know, curves in a graph editor go away because you're not doing so. So that makes, that certainly makes things a lot easier. And that's, and that's sort of my, my immediate intent because for my own purposes, for the work I really want to do, I don't even want a graph editor and I don't want curves. But obviously barring a theoretical, much better animation system, and I have I have a post sort of about that, like a ZBrush analogy, which which I think I think it would be possible actually to produce an animation system where you can do any kind of animation as you know, sort of dealing with this continuous data instead of curves and interpolation as we know them. Well, that doesn't exist, and given that it doesn't exist, there are lots of kind of contexts in which you, of course, will need to interpolate things, and you will need to deal with things in a graph editor, and you're not going to be able to avoid it the way that I would like to in most circumstances. Um, Given that, um, given that uh, that's true, you can, of course, take something like this and bake it to a more conventional rig. And actually, that's probably something where if I was doing if I was doing animation and a really really needed interpolation, that's what I would do. Uh, and you might not even need to bake it. I mean, one of the ways that I might approach that actually, and I think this would have some real benefits, is I take all of these world space transforms, and I would quite literally spline them right there and then as world space transforms. And that may sound crazy, but if you think about it, what you're doing when you're splining something and you're doing all that little, like, uh, moving around with things is you're trying to deal with, like, oh, there's some, like, weird bobble in the movement and I want to smooth it out. That's, like, 90% of what you what you need to, like, noodle around with curves for. This is actually a lot easier to do if there's no relationships between the, the transforms. Um, that's not going to be possible in all circumstances because, I mean, certainly in a VFX context, for instance, you know, you need internal consistency in terms of things like limb length, right? Um, you know, I'm thinking about this sort of like cartoony context where that's not all that important and your poses can be really drastically different. Um, so it's not going to work that way in every circumstance. And in situations where you need a more conventional hierarchical interpolate, you know, hierarchy based, you know, conventional interpolation where there's there's a rig and the rig is being interpolated, then what you'd need to do is to take something like this and either bake it to or directly control some sort of underlying rig with the ephemeral transforms. Um, all of which could totally be done. I don't really want to because that's not what I care about, but um, there's nothing technologically, I think, particularly, um, like there's no, there's no obvious roadblocks to approaching things in that way. So um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit different, but animators are already thinking about things very much from the point of view of like blocking plus, where you're doing all of your poses and you're doing all of your breakdowns. And finally, at the very, very end, you spline things. So you can imagine doing that all with an ephemeral rig right up until you get to that last stage. Yeah, so what what do you rate? We, you know, you're not frozen, cool. Um, yeah. Do we, we, we got to close this down, but... Yep. It, in, in closing, oh man, I, I could go for another hour, but we all have commitments. Uh, being an adult sucks. And what, what do you reckon? It's like one, one of the things that comes out for me in seeing your work, seeing somebody else's as well, but I think yours stands out. Do we need more animators? Like there's, there's a fair few that anim animators that rig, uh, very few that rig decently. Uh, do we need more animators to transition across into development? Forget that rigging, you know, they, they see rigging as the most interesting kind of development very often to fix the problems they have or to understand the tools they use and so on. But the reality of it is that riggings are just the surface level, rigs are the surface level representation of what is eventually, you know, creative software development or engineering or the craft is combining those. 
do we need more animators to understand development and experiment the way they do and the way you do and get more adventures is like is the revolution of animation got it does he have to come from the grassroots or do we need more rigorous like the more technical ones and engineers to start animating and you know build it and they will come so somebody builds this better animation system and then people will you know will eventually flock to it if it's well presented by people that have also animated and therefore understand your needs does it make sense do you get i'm curious what's your take on that because i don't have one and i don't know if you do you know it's a good question and i would say that i think either one of those things could potentially work like i don't know like i'm sure there are some people who could potentially cross over i mean though, though honestly though it's like i'm in a somewhat unusual position like um I, I'm an animator. I, I like to think that I'm reasonably good at it. I'm also capable of doing stuff like writing a no graph. Like, that's a little unusual, and I don't think it would be reasonable to um, expect people to sort of cross over completely that way. A lot of animators would just find that really an impenetrable set of ideas. Even though I, I sort of feel like if you're at all technical, right, if you're already a, t a TD sort of, then this really shouldn't be that difficult. But there are definitely animators for whom it's like, look, this is purely an artistic discipline. Um, I would say I think that it probably matters less that you have people crossing over than that you have really close collaboration and understanding. And maybe some people crossing over is necessary to foster that, but I think that's the most important thing. It's like, I forget who it was who said this, but it's sort of like somebody on TV's Anonymous, I think. It's like, you know, you have end users, right? You're, you're a rigger, animators are your end users. Making software for end users is a, like that's how software gets made, right? Um, and uh, so it isn't really necessary per se for people to cross over. What it is necessary, I think, for people to do is for people to sort of look up from their immediate concerns, which is understandable why they don't. It's like, you have a job to do, right? You have to animate this thing. I'm proposing, say, this really, really different way of doing things. Maybe it's really beneficial, but you're under the gun to produce things. This is everybody's situation, right? And it will take some people who are willing to take some risks. Like, I've been lucky in that being in the position that I'm in where I'm kind of a freelancer and it's like, well, I can kind of do some of the stuff on my own time, right? But, like, if you want to use it in a real production, like, hopefully what I'm hoping is I get to develop this to the point where I'm doing some, like, little shorts with it and stuff, and then people will see what's possible, right? Um, and then, you know, further development will get done. But, um, you know, it's one of those situations where it's, it's going to take people looking up from what they're doing and it's going to take people understanding why what they're doing now isn't good. And that, I think, is the thing that I find most frustrating and most difficult is that you do get a lot of it's sort of like well it's been done this way and it's worked okay and it's like well i mean it's worked okay but you know imagine how much better this would work and this frustrates me because i feel like animation is this, this remarkable medium that's being terribly held back by you know just like kind of really old bad tools and um uh, and that and that there's a possibility for like greater sort of like I don't know I'm get, now, now I'm getting into like you know uh, some stuff that seems probably uh, you know more philosophical but there's this um, there's this remarkable you know sort of sort of life and energy that you can have in really good animation but I don't think it's reasonable to have that all the time when your animation takes as long as it does for us to do animation now and I don't think it needs to. Uh, and I think that better tools are a part of how to avoid having that be the case. And I think it will take some people basically being able to look up from their, you know, situation and say, well, we actually could save millions of dollars. Because it's not, it's not like this is some, like, question of pure art or pure technical skill. There are, you know, better tools would in fact save eventually immense amounts of money. And to have people look at that and say, this is actually worth investing into and you know probably breaking some stuff in the short term so that we can have a much better thing in the long term and uh, the, some combination of animators and more technical people and programmers you know i don't know what combination that necessarily needs to be but it needs to be somebody it's it's gonna happen look i'm gonna let you go yeah, and i'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna like close this mess yeah no no it's great i think it's what everybody yeah. wanted to hear in a way as in it's it's a good yeah. it's a good closing off the stream i reckon we we should quit while we're ahead and we no, haven't no, impeached no, ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So we, we've done pretty well. I don't think anybody is, you know, 
has made any mistakes in this. We should be okay to legally publish this. So, I mean, thanks everybody who, you know, watched the stream, is going to watch the video, whatever. This was a lot of fun, I hope. Um, I hope that we can do it again. It sounds, I mean, there's so much material there. Uh, be cool to do a podcast or something, but we, we all have the time we have, which is practically nothing. Um, I don't think we have any closing questions, and I think it's late enough. Thanks a lot, Raf. Um, yep. It's Thanks been a so pleasure. Really glad to be here. Uh, glad you guys enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I think we're done. Have, have a good night. Yep, you too. <laughs> Cheers, man. See ya. Yep. Bye. All right. That's it. This thing still on? Yes, it is. Trying to think if there is um, if there's anything that's left to say. No, I think we're cool. So response seems to have been good. Hopefully, we'll do it again. Uh, you know, it's unlikely to be something that can be done every week. It was it was pretty hard to actually find a time where everybody, Asia, Australia, the states, everything lined up. We managed. Uh, Miguel actually had to wake up. I don't know. I think I've, he was awake at five thirty um, for the, for the test, so that we wouldn't mess up the audio. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. I am gonna close these, and I will see you on the regular stream as soon as my schedule gets a little bit less hectic, which hopefully will be in a week or so. Have a good day. Have a good night, everybody.